Ready to get pre mass over in here. We're about ready to be started. We're at Occupy Forum. So uh, please stand by. We'll be starting in just a few seconds. Or minutes. Today's live stream. There we go. With Ryan Rising and Ivy Anderson. We're talking about land access, food autonomy, permaculture, and direct action. So that's our uh, uh, live stream tonight will be about. Uh, please stand by. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. thing on that on the floor. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Great. Huh? Is there somebody at the door? Because uh, you have to keep punching the... Thank you. 
So here we go. Ryan Rising and Ivy Anderson, storytelling and discussion, land access, food autonomy, permaculture, and direct action. Come hear stories of direct actions and community organizing over the last few years that have focused on reclaiming access to land to create permaculture and common spaces in the Bay Area. Also, hear a report back from the Zapatista Escuelita, the Little School of Freedom, according to the Zapatistas, the indigenous communities of resistance in Chiapas, Mexico, who reclaimed much of their land base in 1994 and have been self-organizing and living autonomously from the Mexican government ever since, and quite successfully. Both here in the Bay and in the jungles of southern Mexico, it is access to land and what people bring forth from it through the work of their hands that empowers people to live free from systems of domination and exploitation. And there's a quote from Malcolm X, land is the basis of all independence, land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. Our dialogue will explore how people are organizing for access to land around the world and focusing on the big area and the lessons the Zapatistas and others have to share that inform our work here. We will talk about land reclamation, creating permaculture through direct action, and local food autonomy. So let's welcome Ryan and Ivy. <laughs> So I figured we'd start with basically a storytelling of some stories of direct actions that have happened. Um, and then Ivy's going to present some of her work that's happening in the Bayview, um, where they're starting community gardens in the interest of creating access to local, free, organic food for people living there. Um, and then I'll give a report back on the Escuelita, the little school in Chiapas, um, and what I experienced there. And we can talk about the lessons learned there and how they may or may not apply to us here in the Bay Area and what we're doing here. <clears throat> and then maybe we can go into a talk about how this kind of work locally um, interplays with gentrification and how we can create kind of a co cohesive movement to not only create local food autonomy, but also to steward spaces that you know, maintain community access to space and don't lead to gentrification and displacement of people as we do this work. And then we can go into just a broader conversation on all of these issues and what people think about it. and. If there's time for it and inspiration, people actually want to talk about potential action steps and things that we might actually go forward and do, then that's great. That's a really wonderful place to leave off, for sure. Um, so throughout, maybe we'll just uh, collectively come up with some definitions for things, like food autonomy um, and direct action. But for now, I just want to start with, I guess, permaculture and see like, how many people have heard of permaculture or didn't know, know what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so permaculture is basically an amalgamation of all these different uh, traditional ways of people interacting with the land base um, and creating what they need. That's taken on this new definition, but the words actually stem from uh, the combination of the words permanent and culture, um, or more precisely permanent and agriculture. So if we look at permanent culture, culture being the way that we as humans organize our lives. It's a culture that can be hypothetically infinitely sustained if we were to do so. So that's kind of the essence of sustainability, right? If it can continue going and we can continue living this way infinitely, then we're living in a sustainable way. Um, so the first iteration of that word sustainable came out of uh, UN meetings in the 1980s and it was defined as the ability of the current generation to meet their needs now without um, jeopardizing the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it's like really a social definition, um, as much as we've come to look at it as like an ecological thing, and in the same way permaculture is now like, oh, it's a gardening thing, like really it's a really broad social, social cultural way of being that we're talking about. Um, so there's a whole set of tools and ways of doing things and practices that are within that larger definition of permaculture. But really we're looking at like how do we create what we need to sustain ourselves in terms of food, medicine, shelter, um, and much more than that in a way that upholds the health of the ecosystem as a whole and like recognizes the intrinsic value of each part of the ecosystem, plants, insects, fungi, water, air, uh, but also its value to the whole in that a healthy ecology and a healthy us really comes from stewarding, you know, the health of the whole. Um, so to kind of get like on the smaller scale, one of the models 
uh, that's often talked about in permaculture in terms of like plants and how they interplay is this model of the three sisters. Have people heard of that before? No. So the three sisters is a traditional uh, planting pattern indigenous to here in the Americas where people would plant um, corn, beans, and squash all together in the same place. And so what happens is the, the corn grows up through the center of this pattern and it provides a pole for which the beans to grow on because the beans need a trellis to grow in their vertical space. And then the squash creates um, a ground cover, so like a living mulch to shade the soil beneath it and prevent the sun from evaporating all of this water and retains moisture in the soil. And the bean plant is actually fixing nitrogen. It's in this category of plants that can actually take nitrogen out of the air through its leaves and then put that nitrogen into the soil and does that through a symbiotic relationship that the roots of the plant have with um, bacteria, basically, in the ground. And so what we see here is like each of the plants are doing something beneficial for the other plant in this planting pattern. So they're, you know, the corn is providing the stock for the beans to grow around, the beans are providing nitrogen for the corn and for the squash, the squash is creating shade and a living mulch for the beans and for the corn. And so there's a system of mutual aid taking place. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like a big piece of what we started creating three years ago and has been created you know, way before we brought it in with the word Occupy. But in the social systems that we were creating on the ground, where we were creating systems of mutualism <coughs> and horizontal decision-making structures and mutual aid. Um, so I find it really interesting to look at this interplay between like how do we mimic natural ecosystems in a social way, because that's really what permaculture is based on. It's based on looking at natural forest ecologies and natural ecosystems, and then applying that to how we grow food and medicine and buildings in a way that mimics nature instead of replacing nature with our own patterns and techniques. Um, so the first place time that the Occupy movement, at least locally, um, took like a real strong move towards a culture of production and a culture of creation rather than just, um, you know, resistance. rather than, yeah, resistance or what we had already been doing, which was very dependent on the social systems around us, was with Occupy the Farm, um, which started on Earth Day in 2012 over in the East Bay. And how many people already know this story? Tell it, tell it. Tell it, okay. Um, so, basically, there's this piece of land um, in Albany, which is just north of Berkeley and it's called the Gill Tract. Um, and it was given to the University of California in 1910 for the purposes of agriculture and education. And since then, the university has developed about 80% of it into um, mostly housing units for graduate students, has paved over a good portion of it with concrete and pavement and parking lots and things like this. And back in 2012, they were moving towards a development deal that would uh, basically pave over and develop another 10% of that land into a Whole Foods, um, so a grocery store with a parking lot, as well as a retirement complex and a baseball diamond and things like this. And so there's this group of people that came together that organized this action that started on Earth Day 2012 to take back access to that piece of land. So people met up at this place called the Ohlone Greenway. The Ohlone is the name of the indigenous tribe here in the Bay Area. Um, they met at this park called the Ohlone Greenway and they marched over to this piece of land with truck fulls of seedlings and plant starts and tools and chicken tractors, which is um, basically it's a housing for chickens on wheels so that you can move it across the landscape and they eat at the weeds and they poop and manure the ground below it as you move it through the landscape. And, um, all these things and marched over there and we opened the lock to this piece of land and we went in and we immediately went about creating a community farm there. Um, so within like two, three hours, we already had about 40 rows tilled um, and much of them planted with vegetable starts already in the ground, bees, um, beans and peas and squash and tomatoes and cucumbers and all kinds of things like this. Um, within as, as it built up within three weeks, we uh, had about 70 rows of conventional organic row crops like that, as well as um, we started a permaculture garden um, on the like opposing side of that, which we used a no-till method for called sheet mulching. Do people know what sheet mulching is? It's basically a method of um, preparing the soil without tilling it. So on the side where we did these 70 rows of conventional organic ag, we used a rototiller 
where we basically you know, chopped up and plowed the soil, which ends up mixing all of the different soil horizons together and kills a lot of the microbial life and the worms and bacteria and things that are living in the soil, which is actually where much of soil health comes from. It comes from this like living soil food web, not just like the NPK nutrient ratios that people have boiled it down to through the Green Revolution and all these like agricultural advancements. Um, so to sheet mulch, basically we lay cardboard on top of the grass and the weeds and what's growing and then pile uh, compost and topsoil and then a mulch, so like wood chips or straw or something like that. And as these layers break down and create a really healthy topsoil, the cardboard prevents the weeds and grasses underneath them from seeing sunlight and photosynthesizing and kills them off in a way where it just returns all of that nutrients to the soil without disturbing any of the soil life that's happening in, underneath. Um, and then we planted these permaculture gardens where we created basically um, a planting pattern that mimics a natural forest ecology. So we're looking at how a forest works and that it grows trees at uh, an overstory level and then an understory level as well as bushes and all the way down. And so we had you know, an overstory of apple and fig trees which created a windbreak. Um, and then we had an understory of Cape gooseberries and golden raspberries and other things like this. Under that we were planting um, tomatoes and under that we had a ground cover of clover and strawberries and at the root level we were growing Jerusalem artichokes which are like a perennial root tuber that's edible um, and we had vining peas and things like that so we're planting at all le levels of the, the forest canopy if you want to look at it that way um, in order to create another one of those mutual aid systems where all these plants are doing something beneficial for the other one um, yeah please so basically it was looked like a <clears throat> abandoned lot in terms of what was there. I never got over This was like overgrown with um, a lot of mustard. cover crops. Yeah, yeah mustard, mustard and greens, things that they were cover cropping because this piece of land was also being used for um, basically research agriculture, which is corn gene isolation research funded by the FDA. Um, so basically what it does is they're researching the way that particular genes interact in the corn plant, which goes towards genetic modification research and development. Um, but they're not doing that itself, so they don't have to say they're doing anything that has to do with GMOs. They're just doing the research that is like a predecessor to that. Um, so in addition to these things, we created a, a children's educational garden where all these kids got to come through and plant vegetables and plant seeds and have their own little plot. <coughs> Um, and a medicinal garden, we were growing medicinal plants, and we started a garden for the kitchen, so basically like a kitchen garden to grow edibles right there, things that would grow quickly, like basil and herbs that we could use in meals. We were cooking three meals a day, feeding everybody on site for free, much the way we were doing you know, here in downtown San Francisco or in Oakland, but in this case, it was actually like towards production and towards creation um, of something really tangible. So people were waking up at 7 in the morning, tents were coming down, people were farming the land all day, and at 7 o'clock at night, tents would go back up. And for three weeks, we stayed there, um, occupying that piece of land in that way, until the raids started to happen. And so the raids <coughs> began with water shutoffs first. So the University of California shut off the water valves that led to the farm. So then we had to bring our own water on site. And so people would go out with these big cubes um, plastic cubes and go to different houses that were lending support toward us and we would fill up the water cubes there and then we'd bring them to the farm and we couldn't actually get them past the gate. So at that point people would actually start this like human chain of moving water. So filling up gallon by gallon at these cubes on the roadside, passing them over the fence and over the police line to people who would then bring them to the farm. Um, we also created this like ladder to slide things so that people could get into the farm past the gate once they actually, you know, created a barricade there and put a police line at the fence. Um, and then <coughs> days later, the farm actually got raided by um, eight different departments of the UC Police Department who are working in what they call mutual aid. So they actually use this term to describe when <coughs> police departments support each other in like a raid effort because one doesn't have enough force to do it themselves. So. Police from eight different chapters of the university came down, did this coordinated raid, arrested people on site who refused to leave, and then went about bulldozing and plowing into the ground a lot of what we created. Um, but for some reason, and a lot of people think it's because we created this image in the media of these very like Americano 
farmers, like good old boys doing like conventional farming. They didn't plow under about 40 rows of the conventional organic ag. All the permaculture gardens and like the herb spirals and all that weird stuff was plowed under immediately. But these like 40 rows of conventional organic ag were left to keep growing. Um, and so about a month and a half later, every Sunday, the same group of people would organize to go back to open access to the fence again, break the lock, go inside, and weed and water and harvest those rows. And for about four or five consecutive Sundays doing this, we ended up harvesting about two tons of food by weight and giving that out for free to everyone throughout the Bay Area. So we did that through like farm <coughs> stands on the side of roads, or <coughs> community meals, giving stuff to Food Not Bombs and other food sharing <coughs> programs, giving food directly to people at their cars or at their, at their doors to their houses and things like this. Um, yeah, did we use some food then? Okay, and I guess to the Food Bank of America action here in SF where we shut down the Bank of America and shared all this food outside. Um, the UC actually ended up taking that piece of land out of the capital development portion of the UC and putting it back under the College of Natural Resources, maintaining that it'd be a, under a metropolitan agriculture program, as they called it, for at least the next 10 years, and that's actually happened. So now that land's been removed from capital projects, is back under College of Natural Resources and being used as a metropolitan agriculture program. Right now, we're actually there. We have legal, full, university-supported access to an acre and a half as like a pilot project to what that community farm would look like. Um, Whole Foods Corporation actually pulled out of the development deal. So they said, this is too much trouble. We don't want to develop this piece of land anymore. Like, we're getting out of this development deal. So these are like three really tangible results that came from this direct action that we took, the most tangible of them being like two tons of food, organic free food that we actually created and shared with everybody for free. And then beyond those tangible results, there was like the breaking of the illusion, which is maybe the most powerful thing that we did. Um, for decades, there had been community groups around Albany and around Berkeley and the Bay Area working to turn this piece of land into a community farm. They had gone as far as to work with architects and master planners and come up with a uh, design for what this community farm would look like and had gone through you know, meetings with the University of California and petitions, um, forming formal organizations, basically going through all of the avenues that are offered by the institution for how you create change. And none of them actually ended up working out. So through this, we basically went past that, those avenues that are offered by the institution and took power into our own hands <coughs> through direct action to create the change that we wanted to see. Um, and that's really what I mean when I say direct action, is people organizing together in groups and community to actually build the world they want to see with their own hands and taking action to create the change that they want themselves instead of relying on political institutions or corporations or people that hold power structurally to make that change for them. Um, so Joanna Macy, have people heard of her and her work with The Great Turning? She talks about the three spheres of action. So she talks about um, actions that stop the damage that's being done. So whether that be direct actions like blockades and boycotts and things like this, or whether it be political campaigns to vote new people into power or to pass new laws, um, things like this. She talks about actions that create the structures we do want to see. So building the world we do want to bring into being. Um, and then the third, she talks about changing the story, changing the cultural paradigm. And so, Occupy the Farm was, I think, operating with that, at least in the first two, if not the third, in that we were stopping the development of this piece of land, stopping it from being turned into <coughs> parking lots and a grocery store, and we were creating the world we did want to see. We want to see a community farm where everyone had access to a piece of land to grow food together and really create what they needed to live. Um, and this is where I find a lot of the, the empowerment that comes from this kind of work is that once people can actually have access to land to grow and create what they need for their own sustenance with their own hands, they can stop depending on institutions and the state and corporations the way that we do now in this exchange of labor and work and money in order to get those things. Um, so maybe I'll tell another story about um, the People's School for Public Education, and then I'll turn it over to you to speak for a little bit. Um, at the end of the school year in 2012, um, the start of the summer, 
there were four elementary schools in oakland that the oakland unified school district shut down never to reopen again basically saying they couldn't afford to keep them open anymore one of those was called lakeview elementary school and basically of all these schools they were not going to provide any public transportation students would have to go to charter schools or other schools in the district and parents would have to figure out how to get their kids there some of these people don't have cars some of them work at eight in the morning they don't have a way to get their kids miles away to a different school but that's what the university what that's what oakland unified school district said had to happen that was what was within their budget so they shut down these four elementary schools and at lakeview elementary basically a parent a group of parents and teachers and students held a sit-in on the last day so on friday when everyone was packing up their desks and everyone was going home these people sat in at lakeview elementary and at night tents were popped up in the schoolyard they stayed there over the weekend saturday and sunday and on monday they opened what they called the people's school for public education they actually gained access to the actual school building itself and they invited students and parents from all over the bay area to come and bring their kids to this new school that was going to be that was run by volunteers by teachers and people from the community who were volunteering to make the school happen and so parents would bring their kids to the park right across the street from the school they would meet some of the teachers and volunteers who were stewarding that space parents would sign a liability form and then most parents would go off and go run errands or go to work or go about their days and leave their kids at the school until about three o'clock five o'clock in the afternoon when kids would be picked up and for three weeks we had classes every day on social justice art physical education there were theater classes there were some daily workshops at times on like bicycle repair and drumming and things like this and we also had a gardening class there so basically there were these garden beds in the schoolyard that had been left derelict for a really long time and so we decided to you know steward them again and teach kids how to grow food and teach them a lot of things around this so there were basically two age ranges kids were like five to twelve years old for the most part so the younger group we would do things like um, sorting materials into recyclable and reusable materials um, what can be repurposed what's compostable and what has to go to a landfill um, and then with the older kids we would do things like figuring out how to make a good nitrogen to carbon ratio for a compost pile and how to build healthy soils through composting and figuring out you know what material has what carbon to nitrogen ratio and how they go together um, we would start seedlings with them and plant out the garden beds and water and basically teach them all these things around how to grow food um, there was a bed that had been planted with potatoes there and so all these kids got to actually like reach into the soil and pull out these potatoes and we were moving towards um, a couple classes where we we're going to cook these potatoes and create butter out of cream that had been given to us from the farmers market across the street by Strauss Creamery and we'd also been giving like 300 um, nectarines and peaches and plums and we'd boil them down and we we're going to do a fruit leather making class teach them how to dehydrate and dry out fruits and things like this and uh, just as those classes were about to happen uh, the Oakland Police Department came and raided the school and shut it down they arrested a couple people on site and put up a perimeter around the fence and so the fruit drying fruit leather making workshop actually happened on the street that evening um, and there was a big rally that happened where upwards of a thousand people came from all over Oakland to support the school that had been running um, basically voluntarily for the last three weeks and in that I had this dialogue with this one uh, man I think he was a father but I'm not sure he said that for the last five years they've been asking the Oakland Unified School District to build a fence around the elementary school property so that random weirdos couldn't just walk up from the street and into the schoolyard and they hadn't done it and now that people had taken access to this this building and this schoolyard to do something good with it they were building that fence and preventing people from doing that um, so this was a really beautiful model of how we can create everything that we need um, that we don't have to rely on these institutions and the state and corporations to make the changes for us and provide the education and the services that we need that on the ground we could actually create services as you know as complicated sometimes as school and education systems and it was like a really well functioning school for three weeks where kids were learning you know on the ground skills as well as social justice and 
writing and things that went beyond you know hand based things. Um, so yeah, it's just it just speaks to our ability to create what we need, not only in terms of can we grow our own food, can we grow our own building materials, and can we make medicine from plants, and can we exchange those and build community that way, but how about healthcare and how about schools and how about education? Can we actually provide that for ourselves? And these two models kind of speak to the fact that we can and that we did quite successfully. And it was only when the state actually came in and shut those things down through force that they stopped operating. Um, and that really speaks to, I guess the question I'll leave people with and that is like where is the state and where is these institutions in our social ecology? So we look at social ecology, it's you know, like how do different members of an ecosystem work to create the health of the whole and to create the health of each part. And in our current social ecology, where do the state and where do these corporate powers fit into that? Are they you know, a beneficial, symbiotic member of that social ecology or are they a harmful and destructive member of that ecology? Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you for a little while. Um, <coughs> yeah, so I'm, um, Mostly going to talk this is Ivy about Anderson. Garden work that's happening in the Bayview district of San Francisco here. That's where I live. That's where I've done most of my work here in the city surrounding sustainability, community gardens, etc. Um, and I guess I'll just start with kind of a brief history of the area, which um, Bayview has always been a food production zone um, in many different ways throughout history until very recently, with which uh, originally it was not settled by the Ohlone per se, but it was a seasonal gathering ground for both seafood out of the bay itself as well as um, as well as grasses that grew in these large swaths and plains there uh, and on the hills that are run along through Bayview as well towards San Bruno Mountain. It was also a huge area for gathering um, supplies for building housing structures, mats, clothes, because there were just loads of native tule marshes that existed there. So in a way it was it was agriculturally used by the you know indigenous people who lived there for um, you know anywhere people say thousands of years to millennia, who knows what the actual time frame there is. Um, and then you know, eventually Spanish conquest happens. We have this whole vaqueros culture that develops in California and in the Bay Area, these sort of cowboys who built these big ranches. And the Bayview district of San Francisco is actually where a number of these ranches were. So at that time, it switched over to a new form of agriculture, which was um, beef, mostly for tallow, actually, not for meat, but for tallow to export overseas. But so then it was like cowboy country, essentially. And, um, and still producing food, you know, obviously these ranches had their own sort of garden plots where they were growing corn, beans, squash, <laughs> all these other um, sort of things that the, that the cowboys would live off day to day. Um, and then eventually uh, industry is kind of what took over the Bayview. And the Bayview was the perfectly situated place for just kind of the, the most noxious industries of the time. Being at this portion of the bay where the water would just swoop it downward, any you know leftover from whatever industry you were participating in would just be swept away by the waters. Um, and so it became what was called Butcher Town in the 1800s when it was settled by, you know, Irish Americans, uh, Chileans, Italians, these like masses of Latin American and European immigrants who were coming um, just before and during the gold rush times. Um, and so there was still, so then as Butcher Town, in a way, it was still an agricultural area, there were these like huge slaughterhouses that existed there, which is obviously the most romantic kind of agriculture, and it's actually what I think kind of created the baby that we know today, because suddenly it was known as a place that smelled terrible, that had, you know, these big black plumes of smoke everywhere, um, and this then led into the shipbuilding industry. So this is where you know the the history of Bayview switches from an agricultural history to an industrial history. <coughs> um, and suddenly we have shipbuilding, which became mostly prominent during World War II, and which brought out a huge number of um, African American migrants from 
the south, this, you know, Louisiana, Tennessee, all these areas in the southern U.S. to the, the Bayview, the Bay Area, for this booming industry that they can get involved in. And there was a really, when you talk to people who were alive and who lived in Bayview at that time, it was a really flourishing and functional community. You know, there are all these, I live in a single family home that was built in 1942, in the middle of World War II, to house these sort of ship builders. And it's this like beautiful six bedroom house on top of a hill. I have this great view of the bay, you know, and it was built for these families who were primarily African American and who are coming for jobs. Um, and there's, and you talk to these people and they had yards and they're, and people who grew up in Bayview, who you talk to today, they're like, yeah, my grandma used to grow collards and tomatoes and all this stuff right in the front and backyard of their place in Bayview. But then, you know, all these collapses in the industry happen. World War II ends, there's no more need for this like massive shipbuilding, the industry collapses, people are suddenly faced with unemployment, foreclosure, um, can hardly, you know, pay to survive where they've just settled, where they were unsettled and have just settled and now are suddenly unsettled again. So there's all this development of government projects, you know, government subsidized housing and so forth, which, um, you know, you're talking about is the, is the state's role in this grand ecosystem beneficial or not? And for some, I mean, I was raised in government subsidized housing, so in some ways I'd say it's an amazing thing. I'm so blessed that I, you know, was able to live and, and survive without my parents having to work four jobs or what have you. But at the same time, it then creates this, like, ecosystem that is that that just becomes trapped in these cycles of dependence and and also you know when all the odds are against you you're in, in a capitalist society and you're facing constant poverty whether you have you, have a, you may have a roof over your head but there's so much other to sh other struggles to face on a daily basis so um, anyways then the next you know, 30 years or what have you in Bayview were defined by it's like Black Panther radical <laughs> organizing, which is awesome and beautiful. And actually, the place where the garden I work at is uh, is now at was a staging ground for this like crazy dramatic shootout between the Black Panthers and the police at the time after the police had killed a, a black man for supposedly stealing something, which of course turns out he didn't actually do, um, but it caused this like, three-day riot in 1967 with Black Panthers and police like, staging off on the streets. Um, so then you talk to people, I talk to neighbors who were alive through that time, and, and I'm always asking, like, what happened to that energy? What happened to that radical energy? And we all know about, you know, Black Panther breakfast programs, like people talking about growing their own food and feeding their people again in this sort of um, autonomy, this self-sufficiency, this community, uh, this this community bounty that can be created as a cohesive, you know, organized group. You talk to people who live in Bayview now, like what happened to that energy? Where did it go? And all, by and large, people immediately start talking about the crack epi epidemic, mm -hmm. um, you know, the 80s, and. It seemed, and, and, and one quote that I had from a guy who volunteered in my garden one day is, what did he say? He said, so you have Black Panthers who all have guns, they're all armed, and then you, and then crack gets introduced. Well, what happens when you have a bunch of people who have crack and have guns? You know, suddenly, do you know what crack cocaine does to the human mind? It's like the paranoia and the individualism that becomes just like totally, uh, fueled by this this drug, this sickness, it could easily break apart, you know, it breaks apart family bonds every day. Of course, it's going to break up the bonds of any successful radical organizing movement. Um, and so really, when you're in Bayview today, that's what you're seeing is like, is the, um, the remnants of just this absolute, you know, genocide that's happened time and time and time again. And, uh, and so anyways, the garden I work at, 
now is on, um, it's on 3rd Street, right at 3rd and Palu, which is probably the most heavily drug trafficked corner in the city. Um, has some of the highest numbers for murder rates, annual murder rates, rape, prostitution, you know, whatever vice you want to, <laughs> to, to name, it's there, it's happening on that corner. Um, it's a little plaza that used to be a business district, a business corridor, um, but then as the businesses started to close in the late 80s and early 90s due to the financial collapse, um, then it became a drug corner and the guys on the street called it death row. And so eventually the police were like, um, we're not having this, we're gonna cement this thoroughfare off and turn it into a plaza, which didn't actually do much because then there still were no businesses, there still was no actual, or even like actual social gathering ground, it was just like a cement, empty cement block. Um, and so over the years, you know, some businesses have tried to open up there and everything just generally fails and it's really just fallen into this like social decay of just a lot, you just see a lot of um, addiction uh, and a lot of violence, honestly. But so, um, there was a church that was there on that property that couldn't afford, they, they owned the land, but they couldn't afford to upkeep the actual property itself. And so they were forced into demolition and they just had this vacant lot that they still owned, and, but they didn't know what to do with it. And it was just gathering a lot of garbage and weeds essentially. <coughs> and so um, they went to a couple different neighborhood organizations in Bayview and said, what can you do with this space? Well, we eventually would love to be able to build a church again. We don't know if that's actually going to happen. In the meantime, we don't want this space to just go in and so what can you do? So at first there was this guy, uh, Eskinder. He's an Ethiopian immigrant who moved here to the Bay Area about 10, 15 years ago. He started up a restaurant on 3rd Street called the Radio Africa Kitchen, um, where he serves traditional African food. Uh, which he cooks all by himself. He's like the cook, the waiter, the manager, the everything. Um, and then he had this grand idea of, of, I'll take this pot over and I'll start growing the food for the restaurant here. Um, What's his name again? Eskinder, E-S-K-I-N-D-E-R. And I can't remember, his last name is slipping my mind right now, but uh, yeah, it's, you can look him up, Radio Africa Kitchen. Um, so his initial idea was growing the food for the restaurant there, and par partly as like a demonstration garden and an educational garden for people in the community just to see like from farm to table, but also as a continuation of his personal tradition because in Ethiopia, he was growing all the food that he cooked constantly. And so for him, this whole like process of having to go through distributors to buy fruits and vegetables to then cook up and serve was just like, totally out of like absurd to him he was like why is this what it is when we have all this space so he really did a lot of work with a number of different community organizations getting donated wood to build raised planter beds um, getting you know soil and compost donated by the city getting a lot of starts donated from different organizations around um, we had different groups come and install uh, irrigation lines with timers hooked up to the water system so we have really nice drip irrigation going there but then for a skinder suddenly you know he's the he's the cook he's the waiter he's the manager and he's the gardener and he suddenly realized that this was just like way too absurd of you know that you know one one person can only do so much and so then he started going out and talking to different community organizations in the Bayview also and at the time, I was working as a teacher teaching gardening through a group, the Bayview Opera House, which manages this old historic building in the Bayview and also runs art programs out of it. So I had been hired as a gardening teacher there in early 2012. Um, and so we had a couple of our own small little planter beds on our property where we were teaching the kids kids from the neighborhood who were brought down either through after school programs or just as like daycare or through their or through their elementary schools that they were going to in the surrounding area. They were coming to the opera house and I was doing hour long gardening classes with them. 
And so he was kind of like, hey, you guys have the support, I've got the space, how about you take over, you can manage the garden, run educational classes out of it, um, and sort of do what you will with it. I want to like <coughs> clean my hands of it for now because it's too much for me. Uh, so I, so, so that's what happened. I took the space over, um, and it, I guess what I can say is that it's, it's not this like direct action dream of I found the vacant lot and like got all my friends together and dug it up and took it over. Um, but that's absolutely where my sort of politics and heart lies. So while I work for, I work for an organization that's like funded by the San Francisco Arts Commission, has all this clout in some ways, but at the same time they were, the, the thing with Bayview is there's so much vacant space and there's so much that's not really going on that there's also very little oversight. So you can, you kind of can just go in there and do whatever you want and make your dreams happen, whether you're working with, through an organization or not. And even if you are working through an organization, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to 100% dictate what you're doing, which is the kind of, this kind of beautiful middle ground that I've found where, um, uh, where they, where the Baby Opera House kind of owns the place, but I'm the one who's running it, and so I've had the ability to make my own sort of magical dream spot up here. And for me, what that means is, is having a space that really, truly gives back to the community through both education, like providing practical job skills, um, providing healthy food for free, um, and providing green space for both the human community of the Bayview to thrive in, but also the ecological community, which still exists, the birds, the bees, the butterflies, et cetera, the you know, endangered San Francisco garter snake. And, um, and the way that I've sort of done this is literally just by opening the space up. And what is amazing to me is that that's really all you have to do is, like you said, take the fence down, uh, open the gate up, and people respond so, um, they're just so immediately attracted to these green spaces, these places where they can put their hands in the dirt, especially when they're so devoid of that stimulation throughout most of the rest of your lives. And, um, and so I, my sort of average week there is I have two days a week where I just open it up, Mondays and Saturdays, it's open to the public, um, and then Tuesdays I'm there teaching classes to kids in gardening, nutrition, et cetera. Um, but in the times where it's just open it is really the most beautiful thing because, as I said, I'm on the corner that's most, it's, it's mostly drug dealers, addicts, um, prostitutes, and then like, children who are running around unattended, essentially. Um, and, <coughs> you know, these people, and I guess the, the first thing I'd say is, in my, is that there's, you know, there's all these interesting issues with gardening in Bayview that are constantly being sussed out. Especially for me as a white woman coming in and doing it, there's first of all like a reaction against me as like, oh, this is an invader. This is somebody who's trying to destroy our community, who's trying to change the community, who's trying to, you know, increase property values here and like kick us off of the plaza, which is a absolutely legitimate perspective to have. And it's something that I understand entirely when people in the community want to look at me as an intruder or as an invader, you know? It's like, I've only been in Bayview for three years living there. I absolutely could be perceived as such. At the same time, I was thinking when you were talking about these different methods of gardening, like permaculture versus conventional, like tilling, there are different ways to approach actions. And you can till the soil and tear up everything that exists and destroy everything that's in your way for the sake of like planting anew and creating something new. Or you can like lay down car cardboard to incorporate the weeds that exist like back into the system through the decaying and the recycling of nutrients. And that's really this like 
this perfect permacultural example that I'm trying to attain within this garden, the Mendel Roots Garden on Third Street, um, is that instead of wanting to call the police to clean up the streets and to get them to tell them, like, there are drug dealers outside of the garden, we need to send these guys away, instead of, like, destroying the ecosystem that exists there already as, like, as maybe sick and unhealthy as the ecosystem may be, instead of just trying to wipe it out and create the garden, it's all about opening the garden up and letting those people in and seeing how we can engage with them to try to heal themselves and their lives through just participating as active members in their community. And it's really been amazing the, the sort of changes that I've seen and a number of the neighbors around there, and just and just in the way that I engage with my neighbors, you know, before it was first. At first, it was like I'm the antagonizer, uh, and they're being antagonized, and it was this like this weird tension that existed. But the second that it that after just leaving the space open and behaving in a way that was respectful to the lives that already existed there on that plaza, suddenly now it's like. I have people from the plaza who are constantly coming in there like, those are strawberries, aren't those? Like, let me see those. How do I pick them? Teach me how to do this. We have men coming in constantly who are like, can you teach me gardening skills? I want a job. I've never been able to have a job before. Like, I would love to be able to learn these skills to make this happen. Um, you know, there's people who come in, they see the big empty wall, they want to paint a mural on it. It's like, there, there's all this enthusiasm and inspiration that happens just by having the space alone. Um, and so, uh, I guess I'll just conclude by saying that it's, it's a new project, um, but there are many like it in the Bayview, and I think that for me as, a, as an organizer in this way, it's about trying to set, trying to bring all these projects together. Because that's another issue in places like Bayview, is you have hundreds of different like well-meaning people and well-meaning groups who are all like trying to raise money and do the thing for their, their, their different little like, um, you know, whether it's like books for children or what have you, or, <coughs> Garden X. Uh, there's like all these different projects that everybody's fighting for, but they're not. There's nothing cohesive about how they function, and that in and of itself often creates competition because then people are like, oh, there's only so much funding, and there's only so much of this and that. And I need all the attention on me and my project. So I think one of the magical things about space and opening up space like a garden is that a, a garden space can also act as like as a venue or as a classroom, you know, as housing, as what, there's all these like infinite possibilities the second that you reclaim space. Um, and so, yeah, so my whole thing right now is trying to coordinate with other groups in the neighborhood while also being considerate of like what other groups are actually working for the neighborhood versus like what groups are, are working for this like the, to, to till the soil and to change it up versus the people who are trying to like heal the soil and uplift it. Um, so anyhow. If you want to get involved, I'm there on 3rd and Palou every Saturday morning and every Monday afternoon. And everybody's welcome to come in and do some work, get their hands dirty, harvest some veggies. Um, yeah. So that's it. Are there a couple questions before we Yeah. Yeah. Questions. I mean, yeah, well, when you are there are there some questions on this specifically? Because we have more to talk about oh. in terms of like um, some of this really right. gardening work that's going on in the East Bay and the Zapatista Little School. Oh, no. But if there are things that are particular to this, we can go for that now. Yeah. Okay. So um, do you have a? Excuse me. Uh, can you use yeah, yeah. Just say your name when you raise your hand. So, so I was going to suggest maybe since we have two parts, we take a little break for questions and then two, two more parts. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, and then Don, Don, and then Rich. Nick. 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 Okay. So, um, D. Oh, okay. Um, 
I wanted to suggest that if you want to learn permaculture, if you can't make it on the day that Ivy teaches, well, you do teach permaculture. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. It's not so organized. And I have classes with kids that are very organized. The rest of the time it's just sort of open. But I have a lot of knowledge and skills to share. So if you show up, then I can definitely do some more on my work. Yeah. But there's two places that are more structured if you want to really get in depth. And you can help save CCSF, too. Summer school begins on Monday, June 16th at CCSF. And they teach environmental horticulture for credit. And it's intense because it's during the summer. So I highly recommend that you go to CCSF and pick up this and register as soon as you can at www.ccsf.edu. Because you know, there might not be a CCSF the way you know it as CCSF in the future if the ACCJC gets its way. And then, um, so you can kill two birds with one stone and you feed yourself. And then the second thing I wanted to say is also the Permaculture Guild. They meet the first Wednesday of the month at Matter of Trust. I think it's at 6.30 and they teach you permaculture gardening skills. Ryan and I used to go to that when it was held at CPMC. Where's that? Where did you say? Uh, is that Matter of Trust? Do you know where Matter of Trust is? No. It's at 17 and Hoff. It's very near here. It's an ecological oh, center really? that teaches sustainability and recycling oh. and stuff. And different groups use it. Oh. Like that's where they can have those days. It's yeah. Yeah. Cool. Oh, it's it's at three, 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 six, seventeen three or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. the Permaculture Institute. Wait, uh, no. No. Well, yeah, it's a permaculture guild, but they they have a, a website. And well, you guys can see the activity. Yeah, so yeah. Let's, go, let's keep okay. moving. Uh, yeah, and then the third thing I want to say is, even, and most of you are probably renters, right? A few of you I know personally from the peninsula, you own your own homes, but most, like 89% of the people in San Francisco can't afford to buy a home. So even as a renter, even if you live in a multi-unit apartment, you, if you're really nice and approach the landlord right, you know, they'll let you turn the land, the backyard, into a garden. That's what happened to me. When Mrs. Wong was alive, she had a fence around the backyard, and she grew fruit trees and stuff, and only she could pick them up, and her family. But after she died, she left in her will, of course, the building to her kid, and the kids didn't care. And so we took over, and we just planted things. We kept up all the fruit trees. There's roses in there, and, um, Last, last year we planted corn and squash and soybeans, organic. This year we planted other things. You can divide up the garden however you want. You can separate it with little you know, borders, or you can decide to do it as a community project. But usually you might not find everybody's as enthusiastic about gardening, so if there's not that many people, then you can have the whole ring of the place. But it's possible to turn you know, even an apartment building into your own backyard <laughs> if you have a nice landlord. And we promise to take care of it. There's a website called um, Shared Earth, uh -huh. which is about connecting people, like landless people that want to grow food with people that have land, mm -hmm. either backyards, front yards, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you can register on this website, Shared Earth, as mm -hmm. a gardener without land or as somebody with land looking for a gardener. And it matches people together to get mm -hmm. people access. And then work. you can grow food and then share the produce you know, between the people that are doing the growing and the people that have access to that land, usually homeowners or renters or whatever. Um, What's the website It's called Shared Earth. I don't remember if it's stuck. I just wanted to make a, yeah, sorry, a, just a quick comment about that too, in that, you, you know, like you said, the as renters or what have you, we often don't have space to grow. And so that just enhances, you know, the necessity of these sort of community shared garden spaces, especially in the urban environment, obviously. And it's not, and, and so, you know, when there's as many vacant lots in the city as we all walk past on our daily commutes or what have you, those could easily be converted into produ productive growing zones, which I'm sure you're going to talk about when, you know, all, all these various examples, Hayes Valley Farm, for instance, you know, on top of a, a, a crushed freeway on ramp, but um, but there's also something to say about like the systems in which these community garden spaces are structured, and 
Um, a lot of them are done in this like plot by plot. You have your plot, you have your name on it. If you want a plot, you have to wait on a waiting list in order to get in there, which I think is a fine system for a lot of different reasons. And that it gives people a sense of autonomy and they get to make their own mistakes and learn from them and so forth. But there's also um, the garden that I work at we've made like a conscious decision not to have individualized plots and instead to have it run as truly a communal space where all space is everyone's and it's open and if you met, you know, it may be that you plant that strawberry and then you don't get to harvest from it and so there's some heartbreak and disappointments but there's also a lot of collective learning and processes that happen there and also a kind of, and also you, you First of all, don't have to wait on a waiting list forever to get access to the space. And so it kind of destroys this like privatization model that we've all been so ingrained with in the first place that I think is is something important to consider, especially if you ever think about, you know, throwing some soil on the, on an abandoned vacant lot, you know, you kind of have to make these decisions of how will it be organized and that's just one consideration. Yeah, it's actually written into the um San Francisco Park and Rec has a, a book of regulations on what a community garden is in the city of San Francisco. And that's actually part of the regulations is that plots have to be individualized. So people have to have individual plots, they have to garden individually and harvest individually, and there can't be this like collective communal model of everybody gardens together, everybody harvests, they share the space and they share the food that's produced. Um, that's an interesting and that's something really challenging by doing it differently. Um, I just want to talk a little about the, the difference and kind of what I've experienced doing this kind of direct action in San Francisco versus the East Bay. Yeah, it's, it's up to y'all. I mean, I feel like having a dialogue and discussion towards the end. I think so too. I think we should So we're folks aware of like the big action that happened with Hayes Valley Farm getting called Gezi Gardens and all of this. Um, so basically San Francisco, in my experience, has been really powerful for these actions that kind of wake people up and cause a lot of attention and bring people together and foster these dialogues and conversations. Um, and that's really what happened with, with Hayes Valley Farm was this three-year permaculture garden that had been this open green space um, and was garden in this really commons model where everybody grew together and everybody shared from that and got to share that space. There was nothing individualized about it. Um, and it was shut down in order to create a $14 million condominium on that space. And so there was a group of people that occupied um, Hayes Valley Farm and uh, put up some tree sits and tried to prevent it from being developed. And we lasted there for about 12 days before um, there was a huge raid. It was actually one of the most militant raids I've ever experienced. Um, and all of this work, which is interesting, being that it was at a garden. Um, but basically, like, two in the morning, police came in over a back fence unannounced in, like, full SWAT gear. Um, they rushed up to everybody um, and, like, pointed guns to each person's head, basically, and ordered everybody to get towards the front gate and to leave the space. Um, really unusual, like most of the raids, you know, you know the cops are here, there's some kind of announcement, and then they say, you know, you have five minutes to leave or we're gonna evict y'all from, you know, the plaza or whatever it is. In this case, it was like very silent and unannounced. They all came over the back fence before anyone knew they were there and rushed on people, armed. Um, so, San Francisco, I, there's, I mean, there's a medley of things that are taking place high property values and image of the city and all of this that are leading to this kind of thing. But in the East Bay, we've been doing a lot of work that is more successful in terms of longevity and therefore maybe more sustainable. Um, there's a number of pieces of land, empty lots and abandoned spaces that we have taken over um, and turned into productive gardens in the last couple of years. Um, and some of them have lasted for more than you know two years by this point. And the most successful models are models in which um, it's actually the neighborhood that ends up taking over like full agency over a space once it's been begun. Like, as you said, like once the fence is taken down and the door has been opened, what actually happens in the neighborhood kind of taking access and agency over that space is a really beautiful thing. And so um, there's this garden where a bunch of folks that came out of Occupy Oakland 
basically opened up the gate and started turning the soil and planting these garden beds. And then slowly they would introduce some kids off the street to come garden with them, and then a mother that was walking by to come harvest. And eventually all the people that started that space and actually like cut the lock and entered it have left, and it's the neighborhood that's been living there for decades that now has full agency over it. They're harvesting chicken eggs, um, they're watering, they're you know, harvesting squash and, and kale, and using that space as like a productive green space. Um, there are other models where we've like pulled the entire community together by you know flyering and making invita invitations in like a four block radius of an empty lot and brought everyone together to do what's called like a design charrette, which is in permaculture design where a community comes together and creates different versions of what that space might turn into. Um, and it was interesting there because we kind of facilitated this consensus process without actually anyone knowing what consensus was necessarily and like the definition of it. Um, where people would basically brainstorm all the elements that they wanted to put in this space and then we would go through them with the entire neighborhood, everyone that came to this design charrette and uh, you know ask like, Okay, so someone suggested that we have a compost bin on the site. Does anybody have any concerns? Anybody against having a compost bin? And if not, then okay, we have consensus on having a compost bin. And do the same thing for you know some raised beds. Does anybody have any concerns about that? And then maybe we get to goats, and someone be like, oh, I think goats are you know really smelly, and somebody else would be like, I think we should make sure we can take care of plants before we take care of animals. And so we have enough concerns about that to actually cross it off the list. Um, and then of the elements that everyone agreed upon, we would then come up with a collaborative design for what that space could become, that then the neighborhood could all work together to create that design and to build that space from being an empty, abandoned lot into a community garden. Um, I just want to do a shout out to a couple groups in the East Bay, because you mentioned um, job creation, people coming to you and actually asking, like, can you teach me these skills? I haven't had a job longest time and I want to be able to do this stuff. Um, there's uh, an entity called Pathways to Resilience, which is run by Pandora Thomas in the East Bay. And what she's doing is she is um, teaching men who are coming out of the prison system permaculture design, doing a full permaculture design certificate program, and then basically finding them jobs within that work. So ex-convicts who are coming out of the prison system are immediately reintroduced to life outside of the jail um, through permaculture design and this kind of work. And then there's this organization, Planting Justice in the East Bay, which does permaculture design installations for homes. And they hire all ex-convicts, um, primarily men of color, who are coming out of the jail system at $18 an hour. And they'll do like two to three home design and installs for every one that they do for free. So basically they'll do these you know, designs of edible landscapes and permaculture gardens and rainwater collection systems and compost bins and aquaponics and things like this for homes that can afford to pay them for that work. And then every two or three of those they do pays for them to be able to do one for a household that can't afford to pay for that kind of thing. Um, so that's some of the interesting work that's happening in the East Bay around that. Urban tilt. Urban Till is another. In Richmond. Yeah, very, cool. very large and, and very fertile project yeah, in Richmond. Absolutely. Um, Urban Tilt is basically working towards getting access to space so a community can grow food together. Um, and they've been really successful in that, for sure. Um, was the, um, they hire extra for, um, the house, that, was that, um, was that still, uh, um, that's planting justice. So Pathways to Resilience is like doing the permaculture education and doing like actual permaculture courses with these people. And then some of them are getting jobs with planting justice, doing home installations and design. Some of them are getting jobs elsewhere. Um, so with things like Occupy the Farm and the People's School for Public Education um, and these various models, and like you were talking about this dependency that's created with people having access to you know, state services and food stamps and cheap food from the grocery store and things like this. We're living in a time in this moment, at least here, where a lot of people do have alternatives to being able to meet their needs. Like people that were farming there at Occupy the Farm are probably going to be able to get their food from somewhere else, whether it's buying it at the grocery store or using food stamps or something like this. 
the parents that were bringing their kids to the People's School for Public Education, as much as they might prefer that, are going to figure out a way to get their kids to school when the next school year starts. Um, in Chiapas, Mexico, around 1994, there weren't any other options. And so the indigenous people that had lived on that land base for you know, their entire histories, um, when the free trade agreement, um, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, passed in 1994, what it basically did was open up the borders between the United States and Mexico and Canada to allow first world corporations to come in and buy up large swaths of land in Mexico and put them towards agriculture and industry. Um, and also flooded the Mexican market with all of this US corn, mostly genetically modified corn that can be sold at like much cheaper and basically um, took the power of farmers in Mexico who had been growing corn locally and creating that market um, because they were able to flood the market with these subsidized cheaper, cheaper corn there. So basically collectively this, um, displaced many people from their land base throughout Mexico and especially in southern Mexico and Huaca and Chiapas. And so the Zapatistas who have been organizing for 10 years um, since like 1984 in the jungles and in a clandestine way rose up in 1994 on New Year's Day um, and they came into the major cities in Chiapas. Chiapas is the southernmost state of Mexico. It borders Guatemala to its south. Um, and they declared themselves as the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, um, Ejercicio Zapatista de la Liberación Nacional. And um, there was you know, an upsurgence of violence that happened on that day in New Year's 1994. Um, they went to take over some of the state buildings in some of the major cities and declared themselves. But really what they did was take back access to their land base. And so, they prevented some of these corporations from buying and taking access to their land, and they went as far as to take back land from some of the large ranchers that had bought up and used these huge swaths of land in Chiapas that had traditionally been indigenous land. Um, and they went about organizing themselves in community there. And the way that they organize is through um, basically a bottom-up model of decision-making that's based in these caracols, which are centers of good governance. So there's five of them throughout Chiapas. Um, many of them are many hours away from each other. And within each caracol, or like center of good governance, are multiple municipalities. And then within each municipality are multiple towns and villages and pueblos. And so people in each town have assemblies, much like the assemblies that we've had here during Occupy SF and all over the country during these occupations. And they make decisions for their town and their village um, in these small assemblies based on consensus process. And then they send an immediately recallable, basically spoke person. It's not a representative, they're not making decisions, they're like literally representing the decision that was made at the bottom level to these municipal meetings. If the municipality, if all the different villages can come to a consensus there, then it can go up to this center of good governance. And if all the municipalities consent to the same decision, then they make that decision at that level and allows them to have this geographically large scope um, of being able to make decisions and have power together while allowing for the autonomy of each village and each pueblo to, to have their own decision-making ability and govern themselves the way that they wish to. Um, so I went down there in December of this past year to what was called the um, Zapatista Escuelita, or the Little School of Freedom. And basically it's the first time that the Zapatistas have publicly welcomed people from all over Mexico and all over the world to come and learn from them and learn how they build community, how they self-govern themselves, how they create autonomy locally. And um, I went to La Realidad, which is the southernmost caracol. And from there I went to uh, a village called Miguel Hidalgo. And what I experienced there really speaks to the larger vision of what we've been talking about in terms of food autonomy and people being able to experience and self-govern themselves, experience freedom and self-governance themselves um, if they have the ability to create what they need from the land base. And so what I experienced there was that at every meal that we ate, every piece of food came from that locale right there in that village except for the salt. The salt was like the only thing that they were still buying from the outside. But every meal we were eating tortillas, um, made of corn and 
beans and chayote, which is this perennial squash that grows here in San Francisco in this way too. Um, eating chickens that were all running around the village, you know, uncaged and free to roam wherever they might. Um, and eggs from those chickens and fish that they were fishing out of the river. The table itself and each kitchen and building we were in was made from wood that was grown right there in the forests and the jungles there. The medicines that people were using was primarily plant-based medicines, although they would have, you know, some pharmaceuticals coming in from the outside for things that they, you know, there's still some interplay. Like, for example, Coca-Cola is the one thing that you'll still find in many Zapatista communities and towns. Mm -hmm. And it's the weirdest thing because they don't buy any of their food from the outside, but Coca-Cola still has found its way into these communities and they're still like buying Coca-Cola and distributing it at little like markets within each town. Um, and their method of agriculture is so different from what we have here, where we're basically cutting down entire swaths of meadow and swaths of forest and turning them into these monocrop agricultural systems where we're killing the soil food web, we're creating all these chemical petro, petrochemical fertilizers in order to give the plants the nutrients they need, um, laying down all of these herbicides to basically kill all of the growth that comes up when we do this fast release of petrochemical nutrients. And then um, now we've displaced a healthy you know, pest control system that happens naturally when you know, bugs eat each other. So now we unleash these pesticides and fungicides in the soil basically killing off all of the ecology in order to grow our one food source. Um, Daniel Quinn writes about this in, in the story of B and in Ishmael, and he calls it uh, totalitarian agriculture, mm -hmm. which is basically this agricultural system we've created, which evades the basic like rules of nature that humanity has operated in, and all these animals and different parts of the ecosystem have operated in for so long, which is that you, know, you compete to the fullest extent of your abilities, but you don't kill your competitors, you don't kill their food supply, and you don't kill everything that isn't directly useful to you. You allow life to exist as it does, um, and within that you compete. And we've kind of gone completely outside of that, and now we are destroying entire ecosystems in order to grow a monocrop of soy beans in the interest of, you know, for a lot of people creating like a vegetarian alternative so that we can have like ethically good food to eat, but the real result of that is killing entire ecosystems of forests and meadows and insects and animals in order to create this one food source for ourselves. Um, down there, they're growing corn and they're growing beans and they're growing cacao and coffee and they're walking through miles of jungle to get to each little plot of cultivated space that's within rainforest. Um, in the cafetal where they grow cacao and coffee, there's an overstory first of this plant that's related to the coconut, which is producing like an edible nut, and then an understory of banana trees, and then only under that are the actual cacao trees that they're cultivating to sell or to eat. Um, they're cultivating it by basically replanting um, starts of trees and propagating it that way and then cutting down with a machete anything that grows every couple weeks that isn't a cacao tree. So they're not actually killing off these plants. The root structures are still in the ground. They're re-sprouting and growing back. They're not laying down fertilizers. They use no petrochemicals there. They're not laying down any herbicides or fungicides or pesticides or anything like this. They're letting a healthy forest ecology take place and then within that they're cultivating corn in a small area or they're cultivating beans in a small area or cultivating cacao or coffee to sell to like what's called the solidarity market, people that are specifically paying for Zapatista coffee or Zapatista cacao because they want to support what they're doing there. Um, it's a really different model than even what people are doing in Brazil where there's the landless peasants movement or the MST which is the largest, largest organization in South America which is um, basically landless peasants who organize to take back access to land, um, create encampments and create communities and grow food there and basically build community. And um, the MST model actually works closely with the state um, and with the government and asks for them to provide things like education and health services and to use this part of the Brazilian constitution which says that land that's 
not being used for a productive purpose should be turned over to people that will use it for such. And the Zapatista model is completely different. They are basically saying, leave us alone. Like, we know how to create everything that we need. We know how to create food. We know how to grow food. We know how to grow building materials. And we know how to build houses. We know how to grow our medicine and to craft it. We can create what we need. They build their own schools. Um, and they voluntarily you know, steward those school systems. They build their own health clinics. And so their model is basically like hands off. It's just to have these corporations and have the Mexican state and the local Chiapas government leave them alone and to steward their own communities autonomously and provide for themselves. And they're doing it really successfully. Um, so there's very little commerce that happens, but there is like some small scale commerce. You know, they're selling cacao and coffee out to the solidarity market. And sometimes people are buying Coca-Cola or some toilet paper from the little tienda little store in each town. But for the most part, people are just growing food and sharing 